What is up, everyone? It's Kao Satsu here in front of a webcam for the first time in, what, six, seven years? I think the last time I did one of those, the, those I was stereotypically in my parents' basement. Although I wasn't living in the basement, I had my own bedroom. I was just doing that more for atmosphere, but yeah, it's been a while. And, well, I'm just going to use this video to go over my Barnes & Noble slash Amazon Criterion hole, the haul. I still have pronunciation issues. Issues. And for those, for the, like the five people watching this video who don't know what that is, Criterion is a DVD Blu-ray label, which is like the Rolls Royce of Blu-rays, from what they say. Not my, not my words. Heard to someone else. But um, I first found out about them on Accent. I bought a copy of Watership Down, and it was rather pricey. I didn't know why, but I just really just let it go. Then I bought Night of the Living Dead during a horror movie haul. Once again, rather pricey, nicely, 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 but I figured it was, it was too dis, so that's pretty good about why. But then I went and bought Rosemary's Baby, which is out of print, by the way. Hey, hey, and um, and that one I paid 40 bucks because I went to Barnes & Noble during October and bought that one. I, I know a month before their usual November sale, and I had to ask the lady what that was all about. And then she explained it to me. I'm like, okay, I got to do some homework here. here. So and after a while, and there are a whole bunch of videos on Criterion being in titles on YouTube, uh, I would highly advise Dice K. Beppu from Japan. He, he can give you more stuff than I can ever ever give on this title. But anyway, without further ado, I'll go over the stuff I got from Amazon first. Then I'll move over to the stuff I went, went and got from Barnes & Noble. Because I tried to help them out as best I could. But the Barnes & Noble that's closest to me, well, actually there's two close to me. One does not sell movies at all except for a few little things behind the counter. And those are mostly box sets. And the, the one that does sell DVDs and these and Blu-rays, uh, they mainly focus on action figures and games. Like the Criterion selection of there is very, very small. It's just like, like one, sh like one sh small shelf, which basically you work full-time job and we pick through very fast. Yes, so yes. Because matter of fact, I actually went to Columbus the very first day of the sale to get my first haul, well, which was a smart move. Move, but um, Amazon also has a match pricing, amazing competition thing, a thing for those who can't get to a Barnes and Noble. But also this way, they, this way they can get on in on that too. That's what Amazon does. So, so I took advantage of that. So I'll start off with the six tiles I got from Amazon, then go on to the Barnes and Noble haul. All right, first off, and wait for my camera to focus because it's cheap. Silence of the Lambs. Uh, believe it or not, I saw this film for the very first time three months ago. Yeah, and I was very shocked to find out that Hannibal Blecker really is not the star of the movie. He's just the uh, that's the supporting character for Jodie Foster's Clarice. He's he's but um uh, like like but like I was actually rather impressed. I was like I kind of had low expectations because I'm a type of person where like where a lot of people when a lot of people hype things up, I, I just don't see it, but I definitely saw it with this movie, and I definitely have to read the book now because I have not read any of the books. Look, so that's definitely going to be on my read list. Hopefully, before before that's out, this is a two disc digipack, which which is actually the better packaging of the digipacks than they use than most Criterion's do. If you have the original All About Eve release, you should know what I'm talking about. Next is. Beauty and the Beast. No, not the Disney Beauty and the Beast. This is the French film from 1946, directed by Jean Coteau. And I'm, I'm going to be butchering some names here because I got some foreign films and I have pronunciation issues. So I'll use in advance because your name is probably going to get butchered. But this is actually a rather more important film than most people think because this film came out during, like, during the tail end of World War II. Uh, France's uh, like a film production company was in dire trouble after being occupied by the Nazis for so long. So they need this movie to do well, I mean, well to get their film film studios rolling back up. And oh boy, it did well. This one follows the actual Beauty and the Beast fairy, fairy tale more to a T than the Dis than the more famous Disney version does. Like does. And um, this this title actually has two. Um, oh, it's back. Actually has two audio soundtracks. It's like um, there's no English, there's no English dub for this movie. It's in French, but the audio soundtrack is first is the theatrical soundtrack, and then there's the orchestral soundtrack. Soundtrack. Um, I saw this movie on uh, can on Canopy. That's a library streaming service, and I think it only had the theatrical um, soundtrack. So I'm gonna have to listen. 
And so I'm going to have to listen to the Theater Natural Tools Sound Sack later, as well as IO Commentary, here because I love IO Commentary on these things. I really wish Criterion had more of those on their releases. Next, we have M. M, directed by Fritz Lang, probably the most famous film he ever directed. You could say that Fritz Lang was Hitchcock before Hitchcock was a thing, but then again, maybe I'm actually speaking out of turn because I'm not that big of a film aficionado. I'm just a, a, a fan who likes them. But anyway, but I went this one. I went. I saw this one on Canopy as well. And I went into this one thinking like, okay, like let's see what this is, and I left them and I and finished the movie just blown away. Hey, as a matter of fact, I had to add this on my list of top 100 movies of all time. And this movie came out in 1931, so basically this is the oldest movie I have in my um, film collection. But um, it came out in 1931, right around the time the Nazis were starting to take power in France. Fritz Lang, Le Lang being Jewish himself, had to get the heck up on out of there, up to the States. Place where he made a couple films here, but he was not really well received due to the way he treated his actors. Figures to quote Alfred Hitchcock, out actors are like cattle, and he probably had that mentality for Fritz Lang. So Fritz Lang, so and he would make and Lang would make other movies after this that were just as successful, but this is among one of his most famous one. One the the Barnes and Noble only had the DVD, and I have to get these on Blu-ray because if you're gonna be even on sale, if you're gonna be paying the whole. Well, you might as well get your bang for your buck. Next one is from a more is from a, another controversial, controversial director who is currently overseas for some stuff I'm not going to get into, but you know about that already. It is 1965's *Repulsion* by the one and only Roman Polanski. This movie is a bit of a slow burner, and I mean slow. You can actually multitask and watch this movie at the same time and know what's going on, but when it gets, but when it gets to the actual point, it like um then it takes off running. There is one kind of one thing I do kind of find a little bit problematic, although though um the the person in question had it coming in this movie, but like movie, but like but obviously the most famous scene in the movie is the hands coming out of the wall, and actually I as a matter of fact I love this cover design and with uh, with um the actress inside and like inside the hand. And it's really great psychological movie to watch. Matter of fact, um, I would advise watching this this in the dark at uh, night. This was the first English language film, like film that Roman Polanski directed. And of course, you know Polanski's most famous film is Rosemary's Baby. Or you might be one of those people who like Tess better. But um, I saw that when I wasn't that crazy about that. But but once again, the let's see, once again, um, Barnes and Noble, ha well, Columbus only had it on DVD. I wanted the Blu-ray, so I had to get this one out on Amazon. In fact, this is one of the last ones I got. Uh, back, I just got it yesterday. Next is next is David Cronenberg's *The Brood*. This is my second. This is the second Cronenberg uh, film I own. The other uh, one is his version of *The Fly*. Like, this movie is just flat out weird. He's like weird, and if you see this movie, you know why. In fact, I'm not gonna get into it. You gotta see this movie for yourself. Nope, and I saw it like when I, like when I saw it, I um, didn't think much of it again. But then, as as like as the day went on, like it just stuck in my head. And like and then it came to me like, okay, I see what makes this movie good. But I'm not gonna get into it. You're just gonna have to see this one for yourself. No, nope, don't take my word for it. And if you're if you're a David Cronenberg fan, you know why. And finally, this one was a blind buy. I've never seen it before. I have still yet to watch it. But I've heard. Talks about this movie in, within uh, foreign indie film, foreign indie circles, and in, and and among horror fans, it is Michael Henke's. I I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. Hand right. Funny Games from 1997. This is a home from what I tell. This is a home invasion film, and uh, someone actually sort of spoiled one part of the movie towards the end, but it's actually one I don't mind because um, there's a bit of a breakage in it where it's like that comes out of nowhere, like, okay, what just happened? But I love that kind of stuff, that like kind of stuff. And um, this is a home invasion movie, so I'm not expecting this to go well for the people in this one. It never does, does but um, I'm like, but um, hopefully it's better than The Strangers because that movie I find is a bit, a bit overrated, but. That act, but yep, that actually caps off the Amazon portion of my haul. Well, 
And now, uh, and now after a quick edit break, make because I gotta edit this thing, thing, thing a little bit. I will go into go into the stuff I went and got from Barnes and Noble. All right, after like after whatever fade or transition I decide to use when I edit this thing, thing, I actually have a new editing software. Software. This is what happens when your computer crash, when your computer crashes and deletes everything. Yay, technology! But anyway, now I'm gonna go over the stuff that I actually went over to Barnes and Noble to get. The first six, the first six titles I actually went and got from Barnes and Nobles in Columbus. The rest of the one, the ones, um, Columbus, Ohio. For those, like, for those of you who act like out of state watching this, this, the rest of them I went and got from, I got from, from, like, from, like, from here in Cincinnati. Like I said, it's a very sparse selection there. Just one small shelf. It's very depressing. But I'm but give to give them credit, they actually restock their shelves to the best of their abilities, knowing like knowing what limitations they have. So I will give them that. So okay, here's my Barnes and Nobles haul. First, it, if I first, and this is a very popular title in the, in the Criterion Collection. In fact, um, I actually checked this out in the library maybe before I saw this one. It is Charles Lawton's Lawton's Night of the Hunter from 1955. Uh, it's based on the book by Dave Scrub, um, and that book's actually out of print. So don't so don't try looking for it unless you're at a library. All right, it's about like and it stars uh, Shelley Winters and Robert Meacham. Robert Meacham does a really great job in this movie, like movie. Um, he, he is a air quote preacher who actually sorts sought after widows, murders them, and takes their money, like money, and he is flipping crazy. Matter of fact, if you're a churchgoer, like I am a churchgoer myself, and you grew up listening to the song "Leaning on the Everlasting Arms," you might want you'll never think of that song the same way again, because as the preacher sings that song whenever he's about to kill. It's crazy. Um, this was like a, this, like I said, this was directed by directed by um. Okay, how to get his first name right? I know his last name, but Charles Lawton, the ca uh, famous character actor. Actually, you may have, may remember him from a like from, a, from the silent film *The Hunchback of Notre Dame*. This was the only film he ever directed. Directed. Um, he was so disappointed in how this movie did not do well at the box office. It was a flop. It was a disaster. disaster. And it didn't gain fame to over time in the '60s and '70s. But he never directed another film again. And sadly, he died seven years later because he had just been diagnosed with cancer around the time this movie started. But you really gotta check this one out, especially. And you can watch this during during Halloween because like it's a mixture of film noir, horror, or like somewhat like some of a depression era film. It's a, it's a mix. It's a mixture of stuff all in the one. That's really what makes this movie special. Special, and I'm glad I felt like I fumbled onto this one. I actually had the had to call them and have them hold this one because this is a very popular title title, and which I was lucky because when I went up there, there was only the DVD on the shelves, but they have they have this for me. Next, and this is a very popular director in the Criterion Collection. Matter of fact, I had them hold this for me too. But, give, but given how his the box set is more of a desirable item, I shouldn't have worried because everyone decides to get that. And it's it's an Ingmar Bergman film, and this is the very first Ingmar Bergman film I've ever seen. And I'm actually going to try to watch more of his films. Films like, and if I like enough of them, I probably will get that box set. But it's going to be a while because it's it's really expensive. But anyway, it's let's see, it is. Like it's Ingmar Bergman's *The Virgin Spring*. Prop, not like this is not really his most famous movie in the movie, but it's really more famous for um, what inspired it here in the states. Because um, Wes Craven took this, like took this plot and made *The Last Cells on the Left* from this. Yeah, he basically ripped off Bergman, and it took him years to admit that. Admit that, but um, he did. He, he does have some admiration for the film. For the film. Um, so I obviously don't have to go into the plot uh, because if you've seen Last of the Some Left, yeah, if you know what I'm talking about. The only difference here is here is like it also depicts depicts the war going on. Well, not war, but the battle going on between those who practice paganism and Christianity. And I'm not gonna totally get into that because that's a whole whole mess in itself. But even the movie, but the movie he does it more subtly, especially towards the end, because during a certain revenge scene, it gets brutal and like you know, like uh, we're talking. Um, very, like uh, it's like people set on people set on fire, people thrown against the walls, and all of a sudden uh, the the revenge in this movie is brutal. 
Well, and actually, I did not know this. This this film is actually based on a poem. And really what happens to the girl in the poem is a lot worse than what happens to her in the movie. But thank goodness they left that out. And this see, uh, this edition also comes with an English track. So if you're so if you're a, for, a fan of foreign films but don't like reading the subtitles, there is an English track on this one. I've actually watched it both ways. Both ways. But if you're going to watch a Bergman film, this is actually a decent introduction to it. A decent introduction to it. I've seen about four of his movies. Uh, only one of them I wasn't very crazy about, but crazy about. But this is definitely a good place to start with, start with your Bergman if you're trying to be to get into Ingmar Bergman. I'm not just rattling here with most of these, but then again, hey, I love I love movies that much. So, all right. And the next one is like is Roy Ward Baker's A Night to Remember. Based on the book by Walter Lord, and I've actually read that book, and it's and I would highly advise that you read that book if you are, like, if you're into Titanic history. Basically, this like um this film is obviously the bread and butter that James Cameron used for his for his film film, and um and like tell you the truth, I actually like Cameron's film better, maybe only because like it actually details the sinking more accurately because uh, this movie was made in 1958, and uh, the Titanic had not been discovered on the ocean floor yet. Before yet, because like Cameron's film shows this film break shows the ship breaking in half. This film doesn't. But um, even if they did show that, it probably would look kind of weird because they had to use the model set, like use the model set for most for most of the sinking scene. That and obviously shows any live action footage of the ship sailing in this in this movie was actually used by the Queen Victoria or Queen Elizabeth. I forget which ship they that they use. They use. They even use. They, they even use the. It was like a launch ceremony for it, and the Titanic never had a launch ceremony. But, but, but like where this film differs from, like from Cameron's film, this actually we get to the sinking a lot faster, and it just focuses on the people and how they're reacting, and think and how it impacts their lives. And we do see people jumping in the water. We see people struggling in it after the ship sinks and everything, everything. But um, Cameron's film, like film, I, I love that film. Um, it's basically just um, two fictional characters in, in the middle of a historical event. This one actually focuses more on the event. And you're not wrong for liking either one. I like both. Both I hope, and like I was actually afraid they would not have this up in Columbus, but they did. And so I'm actually glad to have this one in my collection now, now especially if I want to do a watch and compare. Here, and next one, okay, this might knock off Halloween as my second favorite, second all-time favorite horror movie. I gotta watch it again. It is Kato Shinto's, and I'm gonna I mispronounce that name, Kureneko. Oh, or translated Black Cat and Bamboo or something like that. It's a samurai film, samurai ghost film, where these two vengeful ghost spirits who are raped and murdered, they come back as ghosts and start killing samurai. But things get tricky with things get tricky when the when the when past love interest comes into the picture as a samurai. And that's all I'm gonna say on this movie. You gotta watch this movie. This movie is better than like better than Ring. Yes, I said it. This movie is way better than Ring. Okay. Next, next is is Preston Sergeant's Sullivan's Travels. Travels. This acts like um this movie actually fe actually features uh Veronica Lake, Lake Lake the one who the the, the actress who Jessica Rabbit is based off of, is based off of. But um she's not in the movie that much though because she was pregnant at the time. But um, this was made at the height of her career before um like before her downfall. Oh, but this is a pretty funny movie. I don't want to give too much of this away. You just gotta see yourself. But to anyone who says forties humor is dated and anything dated and should go away or just Politically incorrect. This movie will prove you wrong, especially during towards the end where they go to watch the Mickey Mouse cartoon because because say what you want about people in the 40s and how their mentality was. There is like you'll know what when you see it. There's a scene that's actually sort of mocks a certain thing that went on on in this country back a long time ago. It just turns it on its head and it's it's just comedic symbolism. But you gotta see it for yourself. You know what I'm talking about. And the last one I got from Columbus. And this is often this is my very very first film I own by this director. I got two more films by by him, but this is the first one I got. Akira Kurosawa's Seven Samurai. This one's a slow movie to watch. Um, matter of fact, um, I made the great mistake of watching this twice after work, but then with work, which is kind of hard hard to focus on. So this is the movie you're gonna watch when you know you're not going anywhere. It's 
three hours long, but it's a good three hours. And it's the and basically this is the movie that 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 ripped like um that the mix set that the Magnificent Seven ripped off. And I have not seen that movie yet, but everyone has wants to make Seven Samurai. Everyone wants to make this film. In fact, if you're a fan of A Bug's Life from Pixar, they got a lot of stuff from Seven Samurai. Just keep that in mind. Mine, but um, I have not watched any of the special features yet, but I'm really looking forward to that. I'm just waiting on a day where I know I'm not going anywhere or doing anything. Okay, gonna try to go through these a little bit more quickly. I'm at the 10 minute mark here. Next is Black Narcissus. This is directed by Michael Powell and Ingmar Pressburger, who actually directed also one of my another one of my favorite all time films, The Red Shoes. I also have that from the collection. But um, this is like um, this is about a group of nuns who go up to like go like try to have a monastery or a church up in the Indian Hills, which is a bad idea, and it sort of drives them a little crazy. The reason I mean, like, just I just just look at this cover. This thing is awesome. And by the way, this is actually the very first movie I own that features the Indian actor Sabu, you know, from the Jungle Book. So yeah, like I like yeah, like that's a bit of amazing there. This next one was a blind buy, but I'm pretty sure I'm gonna like it. It's it's like Kai Kaichi Om like Omatato's put your name again, Sword of Doom. Boom. Uh, it's a, like it's about a violent samurai, so uh, I'm sold. And apparently, this was supposed to be like a, this is based on a newspaper serial. So and and I think this ends as sort of a cliffhanger, but they never made another movie because the you know, I think the creator died or stopped writing it. So. And like so, like so, I already someone know how it ends, but it's it's a bloody samurai movie, and I love that stuff. I do. Oh, and actually, no, I actually lied. Well, there's one more, one more one I got from Amazon. This um, one more I got from Amazon. I totally for, I totally forgot this one. I had the wrong pile. It's the Samurai Trilogy, which features the famous samurai actor Toshiro Mifune, and I know I got that name right because that's easy to pronounce. No, it's, but I, I've only seen the first, the first movie of this trilogy. I've not seen the other ones because I saw the first one from the library. I was like, I don't need to see the other two. I got to get this one. In fact, I ordered this one from Amazon like before I went to work the first day of the sale. You know, so I can't wait to actually actually just watch the interview that, that's featured on this one and see the other two, the other two movies. This one was a blind buy, and I've had my eye on it for some time. It's been in the Barnes & Noble shelf for months. Since no one's ever picked it up in it before, and I, I, I was very curious about it, but the library didn't have it, and I could not stream it for free. So I just went and bought it and watched it, and I liked it. But warning, nothing gets better for our protagonist in this movie. It just gets worse as it goes on, so that's a warning. It is Kenji Miz, like, Miz, like Mizusuchi's is The Life of Oharu. Basically, it shows like like shows like shows she's from a noble family, and it shows how she falls from grace just because she falls in love with someone of lower class. As love like love stinks sometimes, and like I said, it gets worse for this woman. It does not get any better. So, fair warning if you go into this movie, like, and you might come out crying. I mean, I'm just glad I didn't come out of this movie depressed, but I really enjoyed this movie. Like, didn't enjoy this movie. I am so far undefeated when it comes to Criterion Collection blind buys. I'm undefeated in that category. Right. All right. Next one is like is like is um like this like um Daniel P Daniel Pert I can't pronounce it. Daniel Peretti's things like T's. I think it's based on the screenplay by Lorraine Hansberry. Right. May you know this one? It's Raisin the Sun. Uh, uh, featuring Sidney Poitier. And the light, the glare is coming in from outside. But I, I first saw this movie in high school. We read through the book. It was one of those comprehension reading things. I don't, I never really enjoyed those things in high school. But lucky for the teacher, I enjoyed the stories, like the story. And uh, it's been redone on, on Broadway so many times. I, I think they may have might do a musical for it, but I not, don't quote me on that. But my favorite scene in this movie is when the mother just slaps the, uh, like just slaps the mess out of Anita for like, you know, for, you know, for bad mouthing the Almighty. Just don't do that, folks. But this is a great movie, and another scene I really, really rings, especially in today's times, is the very end. And I'm gonna slightly spoil this thing for this, so heads up warning. Thing is, is when like the was when the neighborhood commissioning commission tells like tells them that you can't forcibly change what's in people's hearts. Um, hey, news that like, news outlet. I think I think you need to watch this movie at least that last part. 
You can't inherit, but anyway, I digress. As as this like um this was actually not there just like initially at my Barnes and Nobles, but it was there the next time I went there, so I just went up and got it. Next one, it's another Akira Kurosawa film. Film and um this is actually my second favorite film by him, and um uh, I didn't I didn't I'm Unfortunately, my first one is high and low, but I couldn't get that one. But this is my second favorite Kurosawa film. It is Rashomon. You know what this movie's about? Now, like the premise of the movie has been copied in TV shows and in books for centuries. If you are if you are going to be a a school administrator or principal, this should be required watching because like, because the bratty students are always going to tell a different version of the story, especially when it comes down to confrontations. You need to they they need to watch this movie. If we gotta be have to be required to read certain stuff, they gotta be required to watch certain stuff. All right, I, now I saw this one. I saw this next one on Hulu and went and got it two days later. And it's here. And um, it, this one flew off the shelves because they had to restock it like three times. It is Bong Joon Ho's Memories of Murder. It's like CSI that takes place in Korea. And this is my first ever Korean film that I own. And um, Basically, it's like a it's like the ver like a, it's a version like a murder mystery with a, like a, with a buddy cop comedy feel. Like, although the com the comedy is like this, it's not full blown, but it's just there just to leave the tension. It's based on a real life 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 life, life serial killer in Korea. As a matter of fact, um, a year or two after this movie came out, they actually caught the perpetrator. The perpetrator. They actually talk about this and saw the special features. So that's a pretty interesting watch. Next one, this is actually on my top films to watch when you're feeling depressed. As a matter of fact, I had to, I watched this movie like this like after the, the same day I had to say goodbye to one of my very close friends. Like very close friends. This is is Carol Ballard's The Black Stallion. And, and um this one stayed on the shelf for a long time. No one's even picked this up. This is apparently not one of the more popular titles, but this is a very heartwell film. It's like, it's a very feel good feel good film to watch when you're down. I like I know I'll be watching it the next time I feel down for something. Depression sucks, sucks, sucks. But um, even if you're not a big fan of the movie itself, you gotta appreciate the visuals of this movie, particularly in, during the early parts of the desert scenes. It's a beautiful film. All right, this next one part is a two pack. Um, so I'm just gonna take out the box here, but it's a uh, it is um. Akira Kurosawa's this is the last two Kurosawa films I got. Yojimbo and Son and, and Sanjiro. Sanjiro is blind by. I did not. I have not seen it yet, but I have seen Yojimbo. Oh, um, like um, the movie, the the movie Fistful of Dollars, like, like movie Fistful of Dollars ripped this one, ripped this movie off. Like it completely ripped it off. Matter of fact, like there was a lawsuit about it, but um, it didn't go over. So. If you've seen a fistful of dollars, this is back in the Japanese equivalent equivalent of it. But um, they ripped it from this. They ripped it from this movie. The movie. And I can't wait to see this one. Like this one, I think this one's a little bit more over the top and bloodier, bloodier than Yojimbo, but uh, Limbo. But like I am just a big fan of samurai films, and this was the last one. This was the last one of this pack that the Barnes and Noble had behind the shelf. Uh, getting close to the end. And next one is Michael Kurt, like Kurtz. The Breaking Point. You may know you may know Michael Kurtz for more famously for his movie Mildred Pierce. I also own that movie as well. Well, but um, this is a film noir. It talks about a man who like a man who owns his own boat, but he has but in order to supply money for his family, he has to commit some crimes, including um, um, uh, the illegal trafficking, and it does not go well. I'll leave it at that. And last but not least, and this is a, was a popular title. It's been hard to find. Matter of fact, I called Barnes and Noble for them to hold it, but they didn't. They didn't have it. But someone actually hid this. Someone hid this among the shelves, but they found it and put it back up there. Here it is. Nobuyoko, no, but I can't pronounce the last name. I'm gonna try. 1977 horror art film, House. This movie is really weird. We got weird. We have hungry pianos. Pianos. Uh, let's see. A uh, a blood like a blood spurting, running out the mouth. Cat, which is right there. There and a decapitated head biting hyenas. Yeah, that all that that and a whole bunch of other stuff goes on in this movie. Movie. This is a this is a pure art film. It's an experimental art film, which was like which is which was um 
unusual for Japan at the time. Matter of fact, uh, the director's daughter came up with a lot of ideas, so a lot of the stuff comes from the mind of a child, literally. This movie is just bonkers, and I this was the like, this was the very last one I got from Barnes and Noble before I just made the cutoff, off much to my wallet's happiness. But yeah, so that was that was my Criterion Collection haul for the Barnes and Noble sale of July. I, and um, hopefully I can actually get some, some for the November sale, but that one will be a little bit tricky due to Christmas and everything. And But if I do, I'll make another video. It'll show what I got from there. Here. But I, but till then, I hope, hope you all have a very blessed day. Today, and I shall see you in the next video I make.